It's time for Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Join us as we study the uncompromised Word of God and how it can be applied to our everyday lives. All right, y'all ready to hear about faith? Well, that was fun last week. I love this subject. I know y'all do too. So let's get right in. Let's start off in Romans chapter 10. Last week we talked about what faith is. This week we want to learn how faith works. If we're supposed to live by faith, how do we get it? Where does it come from? If I've got to have it to live off of, uh, to get through life, to live on this earth down here, then I need to know how to get more of it and how, how to increase it. And Romans 10 is our go-to. Instead of just reading verse 17, let's start in verse 13 tonight. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? That doesn't mean a pastor, that means a proclaimer, which is you. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. If you've come around here long at all, you can quote that one with your eyes closed and never, never look at your Bible. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. If you need faith, there is one place to get it. Hear the word. The faith, the faith to believe God comes from hearing his promise. You know, that's even true in the natural. If I'm going to have faith in Catherine, it comes from her promise to me or her word being good to me. And, and that's where we get it from God. We, we choose to believe his word and then we see him watch over his word before me. And we, we start building faith. We choose to hear the word and faith grows out of the word. Please understand that the word of God, the promises of God, are the only way we increase our faith. And you'll hear people say that trials and temptations and tests build their faith. No, they test your faith. <laughs> it's not God testing them. God knows the, God knows the word works. And they, they've come to steal and kill and to destroy, as John 10, 10 tells us. They don't come to build faith. They may let you exercise your faith, and therefore you gain more confidence in your faith. But faith comes from one place, and that place is from the Word of God. It is the source for the God kind of faith. That's why people that are, are in faith always say what the Word of God says. We talked about that a lot in the last two weeks. So there's a, there's a fascinating and very crucial connection between your mouth and your heart. Well, we, we heard Charles Capps a couple of weeks ago teach us on our words. It was a great teaching. Last week we talked what faith is, but I really want tonight for us to get through that, how important that connection is between our mouth and our heart. How do we get to the point of believing? I can, I can read this all day long, but reading it doesn't make it produce in me, Jody. Reading it doesn't, but believing it does. Believing and acting on it does. So I've got to get to that point of not just, not just hearing it and not just reading it, but how do I get to where I can trust in this to the point I'm not letting life circumstances dictate how I'm thinking and how I'm doing things. How do I get to the point of faith? That's what we want to learn tonight. So let's look at Romans 10 starting in verse 6. Shouldn't take you long to get there. You're real close. Romans 10, starting in verse 6. The connection between your mouth and your heart. And we're kind of jumping in the middle here, so you'll just have to read above later. <clears throat> it says, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thy heart, Who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead? But what saith it? 
What saith the righteousness which is of faith? The word, this is what it says. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. And that is the word of faith that we preach. The word is nigh you, it's in your mouth, and it's in your heart. Verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is the ultimate faith project right there. That's how you were saved, was by faith. Now, we, we, we just carry that over to all the other promises of God. We use the same principle. For salvation, healing, prosperity, it's the same principle. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I want to read, if, if y'all have never read, I call it weast. I may be pronouncing it wrong. W-U-E-T. I mean, e, W-U-E-S-T. It's old. I guess this one's dad's. But I want to read the Greek New Testament translation of what we just read from Romans 10. For Moses writes that the man who does the righteousness which is of the law shall live in its sphere. But the righteousness which is out of a source of faith speaks in this manner. Stop saying in your heart who shall ascend into heaven that in its implications is to bring Christ down or who shall descend into the abyss. This, is, this in its implications is to bring Christ up out from among those who are dead. But what does it say? Near you the word is. I just Sometimes when you just reverse words, it just hits you different. Near you the word is, in your mouth and in your heart. This is the word of faith which we are proclaiming. Near you the word is. Where is it? It's in your mouth and in your heart. That's powerful. This is how faith works. This is how we build faith in ourselves. The mouth-heart principle is a powerful it's powerful in building faith. So many times we, co we quote uh, Romans ten seventeen, We think of hearing someone else speak the word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And hearing other people speak the word obviously is important to us. Listening to your CDs, downloading things, having apps, you know, all of that's important. I mean, we grew up on cassette tapes, you know. You had, I can't even tell you how many cassette tapes we still have boxes of Kenneth Hagin and Copeland. And it's important. But there is a connection between your mouth and your heart that is stronger than anything else. Why? Because you were created in the image of God. You were created to believe what you speak. God said, let there be light there was light. Do you think God believes what he says is fixing to come to pass when he says it? You're created in his image. You are made to believe what you say. And so this mouth-heart principle that you'll see throughout the word and some of the things we're going to talk about tonight is crucial. If you're desiring to grow in faith, you need to be speaking the word, not just listening to the word. Why? You were created to believe what you say. There's a power. It also states your will. Your words should be your will. Why? God's word is his will. That's how he functions. You want to know what the will of God is? Look and see what his words are, and you'll know what his will is. Your words should be your will. All these principles that we've learned over the years are so important in building our faith, and I think sometimes in, in the charismatic movement, we get so caught up on listening to the word that we forget the importance of speaking the word out of our own mouth. So listen to your podcast, come to church, listen to the word, but don't forget to use your mouth to speak the word into your heart. Near you the word is, in your mouth and in your heart. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12 and pick up something here. When I was thinking about this, I can kind of remember, and I can't remember which teaching it was that Charles Capps did, but my mind goes back to, to him saying, going through the, 
uh, that the word will go from your mouth to your heart, from your heart to your mouth, and from your mouth to your heart, from your heart to your mouth, and from your mouth to your heart, from your heart to your mouth. You remember him talking about that circulation of how this works? You speak the word. You know, we speak the word before we even believe it. We speak it till we do believe it. So it goes from the mouth to the heart. We're putting the word into our mind to such a degree that we begin to believe what we're saying. And, and that principle is biblical. But I couldn't help but think, and please know that I am just as redneck as I can be, I guess. But my dad has cows. And if you watch a cow, and they're standing there, what are they doing? They're chewing. And so I looked it up. I thought, you know, I remember somebody saying something about this. Maybe it was dad. And how they will, how they will, they will eat that grass or grain or whatever it is. And a cow has more than one stomach. And so it'll go into the first stomach. Please, I started with an R. Please don't ask me to be technical. Let's just get the principle. I'm not that redneck. So it'll go into his first stomach, and then it comes back up. I know, grossness, but he chews it again, and then it goes back. This process that you see these cows, they're not eating new grass all the time. Sometimes they're chewing on what they've already heard, and they bring it back up, already heard, already eaten, and then they bring it back up. In your mouth and in your heart, and in your heart and in your mouth, and in your mouth to, to your heart, and from your heart to your mouth. It's an interesting process. You can Google it. I found a nice little video on it. It's very interesting. Matthew chapter 12. Verse 34. Obviously, he's dealing with the religious bunch here. He says, O generation of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? How are good things coming out of your mouth when your heart is evil? This is not the way this works. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. From the heart to the mouth. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth good things. And I, I love to use the word deposit here, and I think I got that from Dad. A good man out of the good deposit of the heart brings forth good things. So from the heart to the mouth, from the mouth to the heart, that deposit was in there. You can only bring out what you've put in. A good man out of the good deposit of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure or deposit bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Now, really, the main things that we want to remember out of this scripture are these. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if I want my heart, my soul, my mind to be drawing out the word of God, I've got to be putting it in. It can't draw out what I hadn't put in. I need to be hearing the word, speaking the word, seeing the word. All the gates to my heart that the, that the Lord tells us to, to guard so diligently need to be taken in the Word. Hearing it, seeing it, speaking it. That's how we get things in us. Hearing them, seeing them, and speaking them. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. If I want to be speaking the Word, I've got to be putting the Word in. Whatever I've put in is what I, it's coming out my mouth. How many of you recently talked football? Raise your hand. I don't even really care about football, but I watched that game. I mean, you know, national championship, why well, watch the rest of the year? Just wait until it all gets narrowed down to two, and then that's going to be the best game of the year anyway, right? I talked because the game was long, even though the overtime didn't go as long as, I mean, I'd fixed hot tea, I was ready to camp out for the night, and it was over. But my mind was full of it. Because that's what I had seen and heard. So it came out of me. I talked it. I'm not even a football fan. But it's what I put in. You may not even can comprehend healing. But if you'll put in healing, 
it will start coming out your mouth. You may not can see yourself paying your bills and blessing other people, but if you put it in, it will start coming out your mouth. You may not be able to see peace. Your situation may be turmoil tonight, but if you'll put it in, it'll start coming out your mouth. When it starts coming out your mouth, heart, mouth, heart. You're chewing. You're digesting, and you're fixing to be able to live off of it. And that's where we got where we got to be in faith. Hagen said this when I was listening to him last week. And at first, I, I kind of had to stop and think on it a little while. So you may have to write it down and, and ponder. He said, you have to take the step of believing in order to come to the place of knowing. I know, Stacy. It made my head go like that, too. You have to take the step of believing in order to come to the place of knowing. When we choose to say the word, we are choosing to believe. Sometimes, even when we're not to the point of faith yet. We're talking about how to, how to, how to grow in faith, how to get faith. You're choosing to believe. When you choose to say the word about your circumstance, even though your mind can't grasp what the promise of God is in that, in that circumstance yet. You're choosing to believe it, and you're choosing to say it. That's the first step. Then there will come that place of knowing. And when you get to the place of knowing, you have just gotten into faith, and things are fixing to start manifesting. And that's, that's really what we're, we're trying to get through to us tonight. When I choose to speak the word and in line with his word, I'm choosing to believe. People say that they don't want to say it if they don't believe it. You believe it. You say it so that you will believe it. That's your step in believing. I'm choosing to believe. That by his stripes, I was healed. I am choosing to believe that I have the peace of God that passes all understanding. I am choosing to believe that he works all things together for my good. I am choosing to believe that I am the head and not the tail. I am above only and not beneath. You may not feel it. You may not know it. But you're choosing to believe and then you will come to a place of knowing. That's so important that we understand when we start building our faith. Now there's, a, there's an interesting phrase in Matthew chapter 6 and, and I'm just going to pick out one verse here, okay? Let's go to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 31. Jesus is speaking here and it'll be a familiar passage to you when you see it. But he makes this interesting phrase here. Matthew six thirty one. He says, therefore, take no thought. Oh, we hadn't taught this enough lately. Either that or y'all just being really quiet. Therefore, take no thought. Now, if we just take that statement and think on it a minute, how do we take a thought? According to this, we take a thought, claim a thought, lay hold of a thought when we say the thought. Thoughts really don't have much power until you say them. I can think, lose weight, lose weight, lose weight. Oh, gee, I need to lose weight. Oh, man, these clothes don't fit. I need to lose weight. But when the day comes that I say, I'm going to lose weight, my will's involved. I've set something. It's the way God created the universe. There's power to it. And it's not just name it and claim it. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about speaking in line with God's word. Faith. Growing in faith. Therefore, take no thought saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What are we going to do? How's this going to work out? Take no thought saying those things. When you say those things, you're taking the thought. Now, if we, if we look at this right, 
I can choose his thought by speaking his word. I can take his thought in what I say. And that's what we're doing when we're entering into faith. It's an act of my will to believe his words. When I speak his words, even when I can't believe it yet in my heart. I choose to take the thought. I'm laying claim to that thought and making it my own when I speak it. And with time, I come to a place of knowing it in my heart, and then I'm in faith. And then things are fixing to start changing in the atmosphere. So speak the word. Speak the word. Speak the word. Don't let down and just listen to the word. Speak the word. Meditate the word. That word meditate has become a dirty word <laughs> in, 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 in most churches and in Christian society and culture because meditation has been carried over into different forms of religion. But it is a God principle first. They stole it. They manipulated it. But meditation is a God-given principle. Now that word meditate, when you look it up, it means to imagine it, to mutter it, and to talk about it. Meditate the word. Imagine it. See yourself doing what the word says. See yourself being what the word says. Mutter it. Talk to yourself about it. Body, you will work. You will work. You are rested. You are at peace. Mutter it. Meditate it. That sows the word into your heart. And if you've come here for the last 15, 20 years, you know Joshua 1, eight. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. He's fixing to give uh, the definition of leadership success. He said, if you want to succeed at leading these people, Joshua, you don't let this word depart out of your mouth. You keep it in your mouth. Keep it in your mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Now, we're not going to sit around and, and do chantations. Is chantations a word? We're not going to sit around and chant scriptures day and night. But what we are going to do is speak in line with his word day and night. We're never going to speak against what God promised in his word. And that's hard to do. Because circumstances can get awfully loud sometimes. But we choose what we speak. We choose to believe God's word when we speak his word. And so he said, you don't, you don't let the word leave your mouth. You keep it in your mouth. You don't speak anything else. This is what you're going to keep. And you meditate in it day and night. Of course, if you're meditating in it day and night, it is what's going to come out your mouth. I mean, you can just sit and listen to a couple of, of speakers on your computer. Kind of what I try to do during the day. Or I listen to some people when I'm getting ready in the morning. You can't help but speak it. Just like the football game. Thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Why? That thou mayest observe to do. Oh, there's so much power here. So much power in this passage of scripture. If you'll say the word and you'll meditate in it day and night, you, then you will observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Meditate it. Speak the word. Meditate it, imagine it, mutter it, talk about it. The, the connection between your mouth and your heart in the process of faith, it cannot be denied. You, you must do this if you're going to grow in faith and be strong in faith. You know, we've talked about Abraham a lot over the last couple of weeks, so I, I'm not going to turn there because it involves several chapters. But I ask you to study Abraham this week. And in Genesis 15... I'm going to turn there just because I want to pick out a particular verse. Genesis 15, God approaches a man named Abram. That's Exodus. That's why it wasn't working. Way different. Wrong characters. There we go. In chapter 15, God approaches a man named Abram, and he's going to be his great reward, remember? And, and in verse 2, Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? 
And so immediately we see an issue. Abram sees himself childless. What are you going to give me? I see myself childless is really, really the way you could put that down. So God makes Abram a promise. He gives him words to try to get him to see that things can be different. Just like he gives you his word so that you can see things can be different. And so he, he goes to Abram. He makes him a promise that, nope, uh, you're, you're the servant of yours is not going to be your heir. You're going to have an heir out of your own body. And then time went by, 24 years, I think, if I remember and right, from the, when God promised him a child until uh, Sarah, Sarah and Abram's faith started wavering. And they decide that, yes, God's promise was true, that they're going to have a child, but the way he planned it really wasn't working that. So they're going to help God out. Any, anybody in the house tried to help God out? They decided they were going to help God out. And so, of course, they introduce uh, Hagar the maid, and uh, she had Ishmael. And he was born when Abram was 86 years old, but he wasn't the promise. He was a compromise, and there's a whole other lesson right there on going with compromising the promise of God. But then in chapter 17, when Abram was 99, I guess it was, it was 24 years from the time the promise was given until his name was changed. Is that right, Dan? I don't have my Bible out to read it, but in chapter 17, God reapproaches Abram. Abram is now 99 years old. And, and the faith thing is, is not progressing. He does something. Something so simple. He says, I'm going to change your name. And I'm no longer going to call you Abram. But I'm going to call you Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. God considered it done when he gave the promise, just like he considers you healed when he gave the promise, just like he considers you prospered when he gave the promise, just like he considers you at peace when he gave the promise. God considers it done because it's done. That's why faith sees things. But Abraham wasn't seeing it done. Abram wasn't seeing it done. So he changes his name to Abraham. Abraham means father of a multitude. So now when Abraham goes out and deals with all these man servants and woman servants and, and families that he's dealing with, how do you explain the fact, John, that you, you, God changed my name? That alone takes some faith just to say, uh, Sarah, I know you've lived with me a long time, but I'm 99, but I think it's time I, we need to change my name. We're, I'm gonna, call me Abraham from now on, babe. He chose it. Not only he chose it and he spoke it. He had to tell them. He had to say, when he accepted the promise, he had to say, I'm Abraham. And when he said, I'm Abraham, he began to say what God said about him instead of who he saw himself as before. He began to speak the word. Every time he said, I'm Abraham, he was saying, I'm the father of a multitude. He didn't look like it to any of his clan. They had watched this whole thing play out. But he chose to say it. And something powerful happened. He's 99 when God changed his name. At 100, he has a child. Now here we've gone these 24 years. And in one year, after saying what God says about him, and he begins to get a new image, and we'll talk about that on another service. But in chapter 21, Isaac was born. What a great example of how faith works. Study that. See how God helped him grow in faith by teaching him to speak what God had said. Now let's go to Mark chapter 11 because we got to get there before we run out of time, all right? We're going to start in verse 12. Mark 11 is probably the best lesson on faith in the scripture. I, 
it's just it's just to go to if you're teaching someone how to how to stand in faith verse 12 says and on the morrow when they were come from Bethany he and his disciples he was hungry and seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves he came if happily he might find anything thereon and when he came to it he found nothing but leaves for the time of figs was not yet and Jesus answered and said unto it no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever and his disciples heard it and then skip down to verse 20 and in the morning as they passed by they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots and Peter calling to remembrance saith unto him master behold the fig tree which you cursed it's withered away and Jesus answered and said unto them have faith in God he is fixing to teach them faith and in the margin of your Bible or at least in my Bible uh, it says that that should be translated have have the faith of God the Word of God produces the faith of God in you have the faith of God for verily I say unto you I'm going to read the whole thing and then we'll go back because there's so much in here. Verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Jody, isn't this where we want to be? Isn't this where we want to be operating? Not just for ourselves, but in, for the lives of other people? This is the desire. Let's go back and pick this apart. Even though we've studied it for years and years and years, it's still exciting and it still reminds us what we need to do. <clears throat> Have the faith of God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever... That's an important word right there. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain and I think so many times even I after hearing this most of my life I forget and I want to pray about the mountain instead of saying to the mountain do y'all do y'all have that problem bobblehead yep you remember yes we want, to, we, want to, we want to pray about the mountain instead of saying to the mountain. He said, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed. Not, oh Lord, this is a ginormous a mountain. Which is the way most Christians, even me sometimes, approach God. Oh my goodness, I can't believe this is happening. God, oh, whosoever shall say to the mountain, be thou removed. They're speaking to the circumstance. Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart. Now that one right there gives us some trouble sometimes. Because how many of you have decided you're going to do something in faith, you're going to believe God, you're going to trust his word, and a thought of doubt comes every single time because faith goes against nature not only that we have an enemy who wants to rear his little head every now and then and make us think that God's words not working wants to show us circumstances wants to get our eyes off the promise and onto the situation so don't get discouraged just because a thought of doubt goes through your head as I would say, welcome to planet Earth. That is going to happen. But what are you going to do with that thought? You're not going to take it. And you're not going to take it. Main thing is, because you're not going to say it. And, and most of the time, the great temptation is when we have that thought of doubt. It's, it doesn't look like this promise is working. What I believe for is not, it doesn't look like what's happening. We want to immediately share that. Or say that even to ourselves don't take that thought saying what do we do when doubt comes to our minds first of all don't say it 
But as, as dad said for years, you're not going to be blank in the head. So when you get rid of that thought, what are you going to do? You're going to replace it with the promise. No. I mean, if this was Abraham, he would, if the thought came to him, uh, yeah, this doesn't look like this is going to happen. Uh, Sarah's looking awfully old today. Um, he, then he's going to say, no. God told me I am Abraham. I am the father of a multitude. And you're going to do the same thing when the thought of doubt comes. When you believe in God for healing, you're standing on faith and your body's screaming at you. No, I'm not going to go by what I feel. I'm not here to go by what I see. The word of God is true. And you're going to start speaking because there's so much power in you hearing yourself release the word. And if you don't know enough word to release those words, I'm telling you, call us. We will make you some, get you some scriptures for any situation. If you've got a computer, you can Google it. Scriptures on peace, scriptures on healing, scriptures on prosperity, scriptures on children. And you can have a whole list in a matter of 10 seconds. And you start saying them. Because you've got to replace that thought of doubt with a thought of faith. And you've got to do it quick. Don't Take the thought saying and do not entertain with imaginations the, the thought of doubt that came to your head because that's what's going to try to happen. But if you start entertaining that thought, you keep that thought, you're going to end up talking about it and then you've taken it. So don't entertain the thought. You can't sit around and think about what you're going to do if the test comes back bad. You can't sit around and think about what you're going to do if, if the job is not looking good. You cannot entertain those thoughts. Let, get them out. Go right back to the Word. Put your mind back on the Word. But don't panic if a thought of doubt comes. It doesn't mean you're not in faith. In fact, it may mean you are. But you recognize it for what it is. It's there to steal. And you get rid of it. And by replacing it, by saying the promise or talking in line with the promise. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things... We are quiet tonight. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's branded us for 40 years. But shall believe that those things, those things, those things, Things which he saith shall come to pass. And this is where diligence comes in. Dedication and diligence to the word. Because he says you've got to believe that those things that you say come to pass, John, not just this thing. But we've got to start, and it's hard, Mandy, because we've got to start getting to a place where we train ourselves to believe what we say is going to come to pass even if that means I will see you at 10 o'clock. Well, if I'm running late, then I need to make a phone call because my word is important. I need to be able to believe my own words. Don't use your words loosely in jesting and joking. And this is something I have to remind myself of. I need to be able to believe that those things that I say will come to pass. Big question tonight. Do you want the things you're saying to come to pass? And can you believe that the things that you're saying will come to pass? In every area of our life, our word needs to be good. And to the point of, even if I'm going to, if I told you I'm going to meet you at 10 o'clock, if I'm going to be late, I need to make a phone call because it's important to me that I believe my words. It's important to me, to me that you believe my words. But shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. Under those conditions, he shall have whatsoever he saith. The word shall have is important there. Something started in motion. You may not have it in your little hands yet. But faith believes it's, it's in the spirit realm. It's on its way to the physical. He shall have whatsoever he saith. 
Therefore I say unto you, What things soever you desire when you pray. You know, your prayer should be your desire and not your despair. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, most of the religious world is not praying what they desire, they're, they're praying their despair. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Now, if you look at that sentence, when are you supposed to believe you receive them? When you pray. Read it again. What things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Here again, this is where we miss it sometimes. We want to wait till we see things working before we believe that we've received them. But we're supposed to pray believing that we have received them when, that's faith, when we pray. And you can, you can see from our lesson last week the difference between faith and hope, the difference right here. People are praying hoping instead of praying believing. And I catch myself doing it sometimes. In fact, sometimes I'll tell myself, I'm not even going to pray about that yet. Because I know I'm not in faith. So I need to speak the word some more. I need to build, let the word build an image in me more before I even approach this in prayer. Because I'm not to the point where I can believe when I pray. People get disappointed and they think faith's not working, but they weren't there in, they weren't there in faith. They prayed, but they weren't there in faith. The promise here is, what things soever you desire when you pray, if you believe you'll receive them, then you shall have them. So we hear the word. We hear the word, and we hear the word. It begins to build an image, and we may talk about that next week. And that image, when we get to a place where we can believe, then we pray. And, and I, I love, I think it was dad, I don't remember which faith minister it was, that, that used to um, exchange the word pray and say equally. And, and dad taught a great classic, uh, don't separate your saying from your praying. I mean, what a message. Don't separate your saying from your praying. They should be the same. You can't talk one way when you're saying things at work or, or with your mate or with your family and then pray another thing. Your saying and your praying should be equivalent. They should be the same words. If they're not, then we're missing part of this great faith equation that he gives us here in Mark 11. So y'all take Mark 11 this week, dissect it sentence by sentence, and check yourselves out because I, I need to do the same. I have some things that I'm working on in faith and, and I think sometimes I get caught up in the, the words around me, the circumstances, and, and I've got to bring it back in. I've got to get that mind back in line and I've got to get this mouth working, speaking nothing but the word. And uh, when we do that, then we'll get to a place of believing. Then we can pray in faith and we shall have. Amen? Y'all can see. Oh, I'm sorry. Dad? Yes. Yes. I should have said that. Yeah. The battle of faith is in the mind. The, the word, what he's saying for the tape there is verse 23 when it says, and shall not doubt in his heart. A, a lot of, and, it, and there's some great faith ministers whom I love <laughs> and who I grew up under that say that the heart is the spirit. No, not always. Be, because it's got to be the mind here because the spirit knows the truth. It's born of truth. It's, it's born of the incorruptible seed of the word of God. So it doesn't doubt. Spirit doesn't doubt. Spirit knows truth. The mind is what gives you the trouble. And so when we're talking about saying the word until we believe it in the heart here, we're talking about the mind, the flesh. It's the part that gives you the battle. And when we're fighting the fight of faith, which we'll talk about 
uh, in a week or two to come, that's what we're talking about is in the mind, not the spirit. Your spirit's perfect. Yes, the, the spirit is the one that knows when something's not truth. We depend on that, right? When we hear something that's not true about God or from the word, then, then we immediately know, oh, that's, that's a false doctrine. It's that spirit man that knows truth that tells you to cast down a thought that doesn't line up with the word or with God or the, a teaching that doesn't line up. So, good point. Thanks, Dad. All right. We could go on, but we'll go on next week. All right? Y'all can stand. Speak the word this week. Go from uh, just listening to speaking it. And get back in the habit of doing that. And if you need some scriptures to quote over yourself on any situation and you're not sure which ones to use, I probably already have those on my computer. And I can pull them up and print them out in a matter of seconds. And you can start speaking the word of God and it'll give you something to go to. I encourage you to, to keep, if you're fighting a big mind battle, keep some things in your car. Uh, some visual things. I sometimes put things on my, my visor. Uh, I grew up in a house that had scriptures and confessions on the light switches, on the mirrors. You know, just anywhere you looked, you were going to see the word because we were building faith for things. And, and so do that. Do what you need to do to help control this mind and keep it focused on what you need to. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. If you would like more teaching, you can visit our website at www.rccenter.org or download our app to your device. The Russellville Christian Center is located at 305 Lakefront Drive. If you would like to purchase a copy of this program or if you would like more information, please call 479-968-7965.